So the first person who, who you'll be hearing from is Amy Saltzman, Dr. Amy Saltzman from California. And in 2006, I think, I started to receive emails from Amy <coughs> telling me how, what I should do to make uh, the Mindfulness and Education Network website more user-friendly, <laughs> more appeal, of, great, of broader appeal, and other great advice. And uh, I learned that she had this organization called the Association for Mindfulness and Education that was primarily a West Coast organization and that in contrast to our organization, which was mostly a, um, a, a listserv network with a website, they actually had uh, speakers come in like John Kabat-Zinn and Saki Santarelli and others and give, uh, give talks. And in fact, I then learned that they were having a conference and I, I and several other folks from the East Coast were privileged to be invited to this conference. It was for K through 12 educators. <clears throat> and it was a very exciting experience to be surrounded by other people who were interested in the same things that I was. I was a high school math teacher at that time. After the conference, we went home and Amy said, you guys have to do it on the East Coast. So, and she said, I'll give you support because we've learned a lot from our conference. So that was the beginning of the first East Coast Conference, which was in Washington, D.C. two years ago. But we had a, a little bit different vision and we, because we knew that um, the university uh, folks, researchers and uh, uh, teachers had something to learn from the kindergarten teachers and vice versa. And we wanted everybody together who had a common vision. So we uh, partnered with the uh, Center for Contemplative Mind to bring in some of the uh, academics, and that's just been a wonderful partnership. And uh, it's taken a while. It's taken three years to get Amy to come east, but she is here. And so I want to welcome Dr. Amy Saltzman. Good morning. Um, first of all, I'd like to see who's here. And um, there's two parts to that. So just as I'm speaking, it's nice to know who you're speaking to. So I'd like to know how many of you are classroom teachers? Most. How about school counselors or other health care providers? Okay. And other categories that people want recognized? Administrators is one. College. Learning support. Yoga teachers. Have we covered a couple more? Teacher educator, instructional designer, medical school, heart therapist, art therapist, <laughs> heart and art therapist. Okay, um, and how many of you are new to mindfulness practice? Great. How many of you are intermittent to mindfulness practice? How many of you have a daily practice? Great. How many of you have retreat experience? And how many of you are old enough to mindfulness practice to know that you're new to mindfulness practice? <laughs> okay. Um, this morning, we're going to cover as much territory as we cover, but I want to give you a sense of teaching from 
kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. Um, so I'll give some practices and I'll tell you which are which um, that are designed for more kindergarten through second and then we'll move uh, to practices for older students. And um, when I teach to students, the definition I use of mindfulness is mindfulness is paying attention to your life here and now with kindness and curiosity. And I also talk to students about a still quiet place inside of them. Um, awareness is a concept that at least uh, most young children don't quite get and I'm not sure we all get it. Um, and when you're teaching to children, the more they can experience something rather than talk about it, the better off you are. So we're going to uh, do a brief practice on discovering your still quiet place and then I'm going to show a short clip from a fourth grade class of when, what it's like for fourth graders to discover stillness and quietness inside of them. So if you want to put all your stuff down. And other than that, you don't need to shuffle too much. It's not going to be a long practice. So either closing your eyes or uh, if you don't feel comfortable looking at a spot um, just in front of you, that's not too distracting. And perhaps putting your hand on your belly and maybe even just noticing what happens to your body when you do that. And now seeing if you can feel your breath and your belly moving out as you breathe in. And your belly releasing as you breathe out. Feeling the breath and the movement of the belly. Now see if you can pay close enough attention to notice the very beginning of the in-breath, the first sip where your hand starts to move out. See if you can notice your in-breath all the way through from the first sip to where the breath is still just for a moment. Now see if you can notice your whole out breath from where the breath starts to release all the way through to where the breath is still again. And now see if you can rest your attention in those still places between the in-breath and the out-breath. Feeling the stillness and quietness inside of you. And this stillness and quietness is inside of you all the time. When you're happy, 
when you're sad, when you're excited, when you're angry, when you're dancing, when you're reading, the stillness and quietness is always with you. So whenever you're ready, opening your eyes and expanding your attention to include the room. And now I'm going to show you, I hope, <laughs> um, a discussion of fourth graders. This happens to be a classroom in an underserved school in California. Most of the kids are on free lunch. Most of the households, um, the parents do not speak English. You will see that the children do. And we'll see if you can hear that the children do. Uh, and we're going to need to be very quiet for the people in the back to be able to hear the audio. Change for you. So, what do you think changed? You think it changed because he closed his eyes? What do you think? Does that sound like a good idea? Mm -hmm. And did you feel, even if it was just for like a millisecond, did you feel a sense of stillness and peacefulness inside of you? And this whole time, you thought I was crazy. You still think I'm crazy? You can say yes. So we can agree that I'm crazy and that there's some stillness inside of you. Can we agree to both of those or only to the part that I'm crazy? Both. Both. Pretty interesting, huh? Okay. So your turn. Calm. Calm. Relaxed. Relaxed. And you knew Habib's eyes were closed, so that means your eyes must have been open some of the time. But did you have a sense of stillness inside of you, or not so much? Not so much. Not so much, but you do feel relaxed. Did you feel relaxed when you came in for, for class, or it's, is it just a relaxed day for you? You don't know? Pretty calm all day. Okay. So I have one question though for you, Nikki. If you suggested to Habib that he close his eyes, oh, well, actually, you didn't suggest. You noticed that when Habib closed his eyes, that that might have made a difference. So what? How might that apply to you? Do you think it helped if you closed your eyes? Are you willing to try it next time? Okay. More. So um, just so you know where we were in that class, I think that was um, like the second class from the end. And Javid had pretty much been convinced that this whole thing was not for him. And then he had a sense of stillness and quietness. So. Um, one of the things to know is when we're working, I mean, it's true when we work with adults, but perhaps even more true when we work with children, it's not linear. And I always find in class four, which is the same with adults, that I'm kind of thinking, I don't know, this one may, it may not happen. <laughs> so hang in there with yourself and with them when you get to that point. Um, my own experience is that Children three and up can have a sense of stillness and quietness inside of them. Um, 
when you get second, third, and fourth grade, they can actually know that the still quiet place is a reliable place to go for comfort when they're having difficulty. When you get above fourth grade, they can apply it um, pretty much the way we do, although maybe not as consistently, but then if we're honest, we all know sometimes we're not so consistent. But they can actually apply it during difficult times, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so, uh, now my sense is that maybe we'll um, talk briefly about where the field is and where the research is. Um, and the truth is that as a, as a field, we're very young. We're all still learning what works and what doesn't. Um, there, is, there is starting to be some quality research. We have a ways to go. Uh, there's a lovely study by Maria Napoli, and you don't need to scribble too much because summaries of these studies are on um, my website and the Association for Mindfulness website. So my website is stillquietplace.com and the Association for Mindfulness and Education website is mindfuleducation.org. So again, you can listen and not scribble too much. Um, but Maria Napoli did mindfulness and relaxation exercises with first through third graders and found that they had um, increased attention and increased social skills and decreased anxiety and decreased ADHD behaviors, which goes with the increased attention. Um, my study looking, teaching to child parent pairs, which is the same curriculum and has some adaptations for teaching with, to children with their parents, found that the kids had um, increased capacity to orient their att attention and decreased anxiety. And um, a very nice study that was just recently published by um, the folks at the uh, Mindfulness Awareness Research Center at UCLA has shown that children have um, increased in executive function. The children who had kind of deficits in executive function initially then had increases in executive function after doing mindfulness awareness practices. And the last, um, study is a study by Gina Beagle uh, who worked with adolescents showing that adolescents who met the psychiatric definitions for being anxious and depressed um, had reductions in their levels of anxiety and depression after eight weeks of mindfulness so that's huge and um, so I want to talk a little bit about the progression of a typical class, and this is a class for fourth grade and up. So we start with learning that there's a still quiet place um, by attending to the breath. We move to attending to the body and then thoughts and emotions. And I think that one of the things that isn't talked about so much is there's been so much focus on the practice that um, we're not really looking at kind of the possibility of mindfulness or what mindfulness makes possible. And at least for me, a large part of the reason that I teach is teaching the practice is fun and lovely and all those things. But what mindfulness makes possible is choice. And um, for me, that's the important part about teaching mindfulness. It's this awareness of our internal environment allows us to choose how we interact with our external environment. And that, to me, is the significant part of the practice. So the teaching. The teaching of the practice is important, but in some ways for me, it's not, an, it's not enough or it's not, it's not the ends. 
it's the means. Um, and what we really want to focus on supporting the kids in, in then using the information that they've gleaned from the practice in their life. And that's what matters. So now we're going to skip both through the course and up in age. And I'm going to give you a uh, practice for this one. I'm going to offer it as I would offer it to teenagers, just so we can cover the spectrum. And you could certainly adapt it down to probably fourth grade. And may, this practice probably wouldn't work much below fourth grade. So, um, and it's not, we'll just do it. So the practice is called PEACE, and PEACE is an acronym. And you can practice PEACE in difficult situations, and that is whether you are a teenager or not. So this practice would work equally well for teachers in their classrooms or uh, counselors during their counseling sessions or parents in their kitchens. Um, P, P is for pause. So simply being aware that something is difficult and pausing. E, E is for exhale. And after you exhale, you want to inhale, and you want to do that for as long as you need to. A. A is for ex acknowledge, accept, allow. So simply acknowledging that things are difficult, that you're struggling with the math problem, that your backpack with all your stuff is gone. That your best friend is now dating the person who just became your ex. Accepting, acknowledging that things are as they are. And it doesn't mean that you like them. Allowing allowing your experience, your devastated, jealous, livid, D, all of the above, just letting your experience be as it is. C, C is for choose. Given how things are, given your thoughts and your feelings, choosing what you want to do next. And at its best, choosing involves some other C's. So clarity, being clear about what's true for you, making a best attempt at being clear about what's true for anybody else involved. Courage, courage to speak your truth and to hear someone else's truth. Creativity, being willing to be creative about what's possible. And because it starts with C, comedy. Um, and actually, I prefer the word humor, but I have to stick with C's. So um, a sense of humor and not taking ourselves or the situation so seriously and personally definitely goes a long, long way. And E is for engage. So engaging again in the situation. And um, engaging, you can choose also not to engage. And I think um, 
it's really important to let kids, all of us, know that that's sometimes the wisest choice. So we're going to look um, again at what that looks like in some version for uh, fourth graders. Maybe. Hang on one sec. Yeah. And, and what is... Nikki, you ready? Mm -hmm. What? Give me an example. Well, I was just got my cat named Charlie, and I was playing Rochambeau with him when I was about six, and then he chased me down my house and bit me in my leg, so I was bleeding, so I just wanted to knock him out. You and did bleeding. you, or what did you do? I almost did. Yeah, so this is that thing, that almost moment, that moment of almost, like when Paul almost pulled the pigtails or you almost knocked out your cat. <laughs> that almost moment's really important. And if we can be aware of that feeling of, I almost want to knock him out. You, you know what, you go first and then I'll say what I was going to say. Okay. So, um, when I want to watch TV and then my brother changed out, like, I really want to hit him. Yeah. And, and what does is, what is that almost moment feel like in your body? So I don't know. It's the, the audio's not great, and I don't know if you could hear this, but they're talking about what I dubbed after the child said it as almost moments. So the first little boy is talking about almost hitting his cat. And the other girl is talking about almost hitting her sister. Um, and, you know, for them to learn that there's that space, that almost moment where you can choose is really, really important. And um, where I live, in the last six months, we have had five teenagers commit suicide by um, standing in front of the train. And um, I read in the paper this week that s three people at Cornell um, jumped off the bridge. So these almost moments, um, they really matter. I mean, in a way that's, that's difficult to estimate. And giving... Um, children the skills to have their thoughts and feelings, to know what they're thinking and feeling, without their thoughts and feelings having them is huge. And it's also a huge responsibility. And it's not, um, it's not something to undertake lightly and at the same time uh, being, being light about it definitely helps, but the amount of suffering in our classrooms is, um, is astonishing, really. And um, so I want to say something about what it takes, what I think it takes, just a, one opinion, um, to do this work with children. And the first thing it takes is it takes that you have your own practice and that you've spent some time as the Araya Mountain Dreamer poem, The Invitation says, um, liking your, the company you keep and standing in your own fire, being with your own sorrow and being with your own joy um, so that you've walked the territory. Um, the other thing it takes is uh, finding a way, um, if you're in a public school setting, to deliver these um, offerings in a way that, in ways that are secular and accessible and as jargon-free as possible. And the last thing it takes is to be able to hold 
what comes up in the room. And again, that gets back to practice. Um, in any school setting, there are children who have been through neglect, d divorce, their illness, parental illness, um, abuse. Um, in some school settings, the, unfortunately, that's the norm. And um, so you need, if you're in the room with the kids, even if you have school counseling support or external systems, when something comes up in the room, you need to be able to hold it until those others, at least until those other systems can be put in place. Um, and it's, again, it's no small thing. So to close, I wanted to offer um, my children's version of the wheel practice that Dan did last night. So uh, again, you can put down your goodies. <laughs> And this practice is called flashlight. So just um, if you wish, closing your eyes, finding your breath, shining the flashlight of your attention on your breath in your belly. And now gently shifting the flashlight of attention to your body. Maybe feeling the areas where your body makes contact with the bench and where it doesn't. Maybe shining your flashlight of attention on an area of your body that initially seems neutral or boring, the place where your ear joins your head, your eyelids or the crease of your elbow, just shining the flashlight of attention on one area of your body and just noticing the sensations that are there. Gently shifting the flashlight of attention to your thoughts, noticing with kindness any thoughts that are present, perhaps noticing that when we shine our flashlight of attention on thoughts, they tend to scurry into the corners. Gently shifting your flashlight of attention again and shining it on your emotions or feelings. Just noticing with kindness whatever feelings are present here. Not trying to change anything or make them different. And now letting the breath and the body and thoughts and feelings fade into the background and for a moment shining the flashlight of attention on the still quiet place. Letting the flashlight rest on the stillness and quietness.
And when you're ready, opening your eyes, expanding your flashlight of attention to include the room. And just taking a moment to shine the flashlight of attention on everything that you can see, the colors, the shapes, the faces, And one teacher in a classroom I was in said, you know, sometimes they just need to turn their flashlights of attention on. So she liked it because she could use it with her kids to say, turn your flashlights on or put your flashlights over here. So um, may you discover your own stillness and quietness. May you practice peace in your classrooms and offices and homes and then joyfully share that with the children and anyone that you come in contact with.